Yeah, so first off, I'm, I'm Tor Fjallde. I am a PhD student at Cambridge University in the machine learning lab here. And um, I work mainly on sort of methodology for like Bayesian inference and more like on the method side. But I also work on this probabilistic programming language called Turing.jl. Uh, and I've been doing that for, for quite a few years. Um, and that's what I'll be talking about here today. And yes, uh, do, do interrupt me and ask questions during. Um, I'm not an expert on sort of inverse problems. I'm more on the, the Bayesian inference side. Um, and so if you have questions relating to, to certain problems and so on, like please just interrupt. I'll, I'll go through um, more of the Bayesian inference side really. And so um, if you have any questions about different methods and so on, as I go through them, interrupt me. And I'll try my best to answer. So um, first thing, um, if I can get this to work, there we go. So one fair question is why even bother with Bayesian inference? And so what I'll do here, and as mentioned, I'm not an expert on inverse problems, um, but as far as I understand, these can be sort of generally be summarized as basically wanting to demonstrate some X in this scenario, um, where you have some Ys that are known or observed, and you have this F that is generally computable, either numerically or in closed form, and then you kind of want to find an X such that you minimize some distance um, between the, the sort of the output Y here and this F of X. And in the real world, Y is also generally noisy, which you know adds complexity to the problem. So one approach can be to sort of just regularize it, regularize the solution in some way. And so generally the idea here is to swap the original and possibly unstable inverse problem with a nearby stable one. The example, uh, one example can be sort of this regularization technique called Tikhonov regularization, where basically you have this argument uh, objective as we had before, in this particular case, it's generally related to the squared loss, and you add some penalization. So here G sort of penalizes some of your solution in this X, and this lambda here is kind of um, what you want to, something you choose to depending on like to decide how much to actually regularize the solution. If you bring it down to zero, of course, you get back to sort of the standard one, but if you bring it to infinity, this loss is completely sort of useless. Um, and one sort of the, the trouble here is often that you, whether like how well this would actually work is highly dependent on the choice of, of this sort of this lambda here. Um, there's also the case of sort of these, uh, when you have to use the iterative solvers and so on, Early stopping is one form that can often be used as regularization, and then you also need to choose the stopping criteria. Um, in both of these cases, generally the the lambda and the, from the previous from the ticket of uh, regularization and stopping criteria, there are there are parameters we have to choose. Right, you have to decide what where what I guess sort of what threshold you're going to stop the iterations, or um, at which kind of uh, which kind of regularization parameter you want to use. This is the sort of figure from this paper that I've been using, that I've been looking at. Um, and um, generally my, my sort of knowledge of these kids' problems comes from looking at this paper and also looking at one, one lecture by, by Chris Rakakis, which was quite useful. But so this is generally how it looks when you do regularization. You have like some prior information and you have about your solution features or the smoothness. And so you apply some, some regularization term or a stopping rule. Then you get your data. Um, and you combine it with the forward model, and then you get it like ideally you get back a single solution. So, Bayesian inference is then that instead of doing this regularization by sort of figuring out a stopping criteria and um, or sort of having to choose this parameter lambda, you sort of go, well, in the real world, our model is never going to be absolutely perfect. It's going to be pretty, can be pretty, it can still be useful, but it's never, not, never, very rarely going to be perfect due to measurement errors and these sorts of things. And so instead, we're going to sort of create this generative model where we have some prior beliefs about the underlying parameters, like these x's, and we're going to use the data to update these beliefs. And these prior beliefs then will sort of act as this regularization. Um, in general, right, it looks something like this, where you have this x, as in before. And now you have this y where this like where there's some likelihood term. And in we're looking at if these inverse problems, this part here will generally be you know related to this f of x, right? And then from base theorem, we can then figure out the distribution over the x here, given the data y's. Right, so this f here generally comes into this this likelihood over here. This also means that 
one, we sort of get back a solution for the DEXs, but we also hopefully that we also get a distribution over our posterior beliefs, given what we sort of have before. The hope here is that by sort of writing down a generative model for how we sort of basically think the data came about, you it becomes way more natural to encode these regularizations of these like prior beliefs into the model rather than sort of regularizing like a, um, necessarily like the smoothness and something like that directly. And in particular, right, like having distributions is particularly useful if you want to quantify uncertainty, which is very common when you know you have small amounts of data or there's a very sort of high um, high noise, like low signal to noise ratio. Um, and then it's generally like a point estimate will not be sufficient, right? If you sort of have just a few few, few data points and then you try to estimate a parameter, then you get a point estimate and it looks a bit fishy if you don't report this as kind of the way to go when you when you could also have uh, when you only have like a few data points. So this is particularly when it becomes useful to do these kind of things. And so this is kind of how it looks, um, right? So now you have this prior belief, and in this prior belief, you encode smoothness, varsity, sample, um, and structure, and all these sort of goes into defining like the general like the generative data, the generative model basically. So how basically we go from these y's sampled from this p. Um, given the axis. This is like the likelihood, right? This is sort of, this is basically like the structure, for example, will often come into this place and so on. And so in this here, you, this part here uh, relates to the, the sort of prior belief over the axis, right? And then this feeds into this. And so here's this likelihood comes in there. Um, and this makes it so that in general, in particular in sort of scientific applications, you you have quite a lot of knowledge about how um, um, how how things should actually look, and so sort of just uh, doing something that's completely uniform or, or uh, um, like putting like uniform prize and so on is generally not the, the, the ideal way to go about it. So is there anything like is everyone on board on this kind of like how how sort of this these two relates now the regular like regularization methods and also kind of like how um, like the Bayesian inference relate. So here in Bayesian inference, regularization happens to the prior, the prior belief. And then we have this likelihood, which basically defines how um, how the, these latent parameters with X's relate to the to the actual set of data, which generally involves this X function. Given that I have no objections, I will, I will continue onwards. One thing that's more to notice is like note, for example, in simple scenarios, so there has point single point estimate where if you do sort of the argmax of this posterior, then in something like linear regression, you can, for example, view this linear regularized linear regression where, um, where you sort of add this kind of uh, penalty to your weights. And that's this uh, this scenario, uh, linear, like regular, regularized linear regression can actually be viewed as sort of uh, argmaxing over the, the posterior. Uh, belief where you have sort of a Gaussian prior on the, the weights of your linear regression. This is an example where there's like a very direct correspondence between regularization um, and and then sort of uh, Bayesian inference. But in general, it gives you way more flexibility and it becomes way more natural to actually define these prior beliefs and this regularization based, uh, basically in your model. So this brings us to how to actually work with this posterior because generally this P of Y of X sorry, it um, should be P of X, Y, is not necessarily easy to, to access, in particular for like very complex models. And so then we need something called Marco Chain Monte Carlo. It's not the only way to do things, but it's one of the ways to do things. So the setup here is that now we have this target distribution P, uh, P such that P is the P of X is equal to some, um, so this P tilde of X divided by some normalization factor, this is constant, uh, is in in x and the the um this here like here i've dropped it depends on y because basically saying that um and this is just because in general um marco j monte carlo doesn't actually it's not only, not only restricted to bayesian inference so you can sample from from just arbitrary distributions well, not arbitrary but it's more general than just for bayesian and bayesian inference but in like typically this this part here and like when we when we're interested in bayesian inference this will be pi of x given some y, right? A bit confusing notation. This is what we want to do. 
And so the idea with Markovich and Monte Carlo is that you construct a sequence of random variables xi uh, such that hopefully you know the the sort of the the uh, empirical average goes of some function evaluated at these xi's goes towards the expectation that you're actually interested in. Right. This is basically saying that we we in some sense hope that this converges to this p here. So this p is a distribution of interest for uh, interest, for example, the posterior distribution, um, and this is generally like the g objective basically. And so to construct this sequence, like this is a sequence of random variables, you have to use in Markov chain Monte Carlo, use what's called a Markov kernel, meaning that you generate uh, the sequence by sort of first sampling x zero from some base distribution called mu. And then you apply this kernel iteratively to construct this sequence up here. And so under some assumptions on this kernel and the actual target that you're interested in, you actually get this convergence that you want, basically saying that the empirical average, taking the average over these things, evaluating the function, gives you the actual expectation you're after. And this f fair right? This can be the mean, it can be the variance, it can be like quantiles. Uh, it can be like histograms. It's, it's not really restricted. Well, it's restricted when you want the actual convergence guarantees, but but it's generally quite quite flexible. More under, moreover, under certain assumptions on this k, uh, this uh, this kernel k, and these xi's sort of being independent, we sort of have it and CL, like a CLT result, which looks like this, right? This is just classical like central limit theorem, basically saying that we can also quantify the the variance in finite time on our estimator. In, but in in Marco Chain Monte Carlo, since we're constructing this these exercises, they're not independent, and so we need to adjust the estimate for this autocorrelation. And so now we divide by this effective sample size rather than this uh, the actual sample size, the actual number of um, number of iteration we're taking. This part here is based it's called the integrated autocorrelation time. Um, so if you sort of if you looked at base if you looked at a MCMC a bit before and tried to to work with it, you generally you will often sort of have people talking about the autocorrelation time, um, and they were looking at these these functions like this uh, these quantity series, um, and it is um, basically this is just a way to sort of direct this effective sample size is just a way of saying directly how effectively how many samples have I gotten when I do n iterations, right? And then you normalize it by the integrated autocorrelation time. And so if you do a thousand iterations, but actually the autocorrelation time is very, very high because this is sort of the samples of uh, highly correlated, then um, you know, and you only get like a hundred, then sort of the, this is just this is just like the, the autocorrelation time sort of normalizing this basically. And I mentioned this because this is something that comes up in practice often, and this autocorrelation time is also something that people generally look at when they're trying to di diagnose whether or not your chain has actually converged or not. I'm also going to just make sure I'm looking at time as I have like some notion of, okay, good. Uh, so the first and most simple method that most people see is what's called the Metropolis Hastings um, algorithm. And the idea here is that this kernel that was said, that sort of, they, they were talking about that propagates these samples and creates this sequence of samples is effectively just proposing, um, proposing using this Q here. So you sort of sample uh, x from q x dash. And so this is the, this is like your proposed point, and then you accept or reject it with this acceptance right here. And that is all. And th this can be very very general. And like classic, if you have like a random walk metropolis Hastings, then this q here will basically be a uh, isotropic Gaussian, for example, right? And then you sort of just propose uh, random points around the, the, the current point, and then you accept or reject. And this is this is quite a fundamental one. It was, this is kind of a metropolis Hastings is, is really uh, the bedrock of a lot of MCMC that goes on today. And one particular useful pro, uh, useful uh, useful property is that the acceptance of purity doesn't actually depend on this normalization constant. The reason why this, as I mentioned earlier, right, we could sort of write this p of x as equal to some p of x tilde divided by some c p, and this thing uh, will just cancel out in this part here. And that's nice because this CP here is generally going to be, you know, is equal to the integral over over this thing, and this will just complicate the problem. Uh, generally intractable, right? And so this is kind of why 
a big part of why Metropolis lessons is so incredibly useful is just because this just counts well. So here is an example of uh, Metropolis testing. So this is the random walk Metropolis testing that I mentioned. And this is one I sort of, you know, if you have questions and you're like, like uh, wondering about something, I really want everyone to get sort of intuition about uh, of how these samples work. And so please do ask questions here. But here you can see how the, the Metropolis says example works. So you see the target here is this, this Gaussian in the background. And at the bottom, you see a histogram that the line is the true. So this line here is a true histogram, like uh, the true the module the distribution. And then we have this, um, this histogram here that's being updated according to the samples. And you can see this, um, the proposal here is this, uh, this sort of these two circles, this is the proposal distribution and we sample from the proposal distribution. And if we accept the point that we sampled, you get a green line as we see here. And then sometimes you will get a red line like here. And note that this is not like necessary, this is not going to be sort of seeking the mode or anything like this, right? This is just trying to basically uh, accurately obtain these histograms. It's one way of viewing it. And so if I speed things up and also look at a more interesting problem, here you can see more metropolis tastings, um, like random walk metropolis tastings, trying to sample from this, this kind of like donut shape, uh, this donut distribution. Um, as you see, like it's doing a much poorer job. There's way more uh, samples are being rejected here because it's just like proposing samples outside of the actual um, the probability regions. And so they don't just end up being rejected. And it just takes quite a long time for it to actually accurately represent to for it to converge or rather for it to accurately represent these histograms. Um, and this kind of, um, we often refer like, this is often referred to as like the typical set. Um, uh, which is basically kind of considered to be a set. You can think of it as a set which has a lot of the probability match, right? Because in Bayesian inference or rather than sampling in general, you're not after the mode or anything of the sort. You're really after um, to, to spend a lot of time in the regions which have high probability. And high probability doesn't mean pro pointwise probability, right? It means that it's just have like this region has like some probability while this has like basically nothing. This is Metropolis Hastings, right? You can try to make it more fancy. And so here you have an adaptive Metropolis Hastings. So now you're actually sampling from the proposal here is a full covariance matrix. And we're changing this as we go along to make sure that we're still sampling with a true distribution. Like this will depend on the time and it will sort of converge to a true value, like some certain value ideally uh, as time goes on, because otherwise you're not going to be sampling from the true distribution. But even when we do this Metropolis Hastings series, as you see, when it's non-Gaussian, even when we do this kind of uh, approach where we try to adapt it, the problem is that if we adapt a covariance matrix over here, it ends up looking something like this. But then once you get to this point, a similar covariance matrix is going to be pretty, like, it's not going to be that useful. Okay, at this point, it's kind of useful, but here, for example, it's not. Um, and so here, as you see, now it starts like widening it again. And so this is also non-ideal. So generally, Metropolis testing is not that like, used that often in, in practice uh, these days um, because, of, because of this problem. And I just want to point out that I, this animation stuff is not made uh, by me. This is from uh, Chang Wang here. Um, I just came across his work and it's, it's really nice. And so I've just sort of added some additional algorithms and stuff like this. But it's, this is really, uh, he's uh, this is like the source of the bulk of the work for, for this animation stuff. So, there's one another sampler which is called something that people come across very often is Gibbs sampling. And in Gibbs sampling, it can be seen as Metropolis Hastings with the proposal where now you're basically sampling. So right, remember how we have we're sampling in we're interested in sampling this. And so now we're looking at we're just taking one component, we're sampling component wise, sampling this, and then we go to the next one, and then we sample say XJ and so on and so on. And eventually you go through all the variables and you sort of sample the new, you obtain a new sample of this thing. The standard Gibbs is not particularly applicable to general problems because we usually don't have access to this, right? Like if you were to write this out, this would be this. And then you have to integrate out all the, uh, there we go. Uh, you have to integrate all out all these, um, these components that you're ignoring, right? Uh, well, this is actually, um, and so, um, well, it's not true. You're not integrating it out. You're just uh, just dividing by you're dividing. Sorry, you're dividing by the p of x uh, i, and this needs to be integrated. Um, 
But what you can do, so in general, you have the access, but what you can do, and when you give something actually becomes quite useful in practice, is that you do this, you put Metropolis Hastings samplers to target this thing inside of these GIP samplers. And so you have this called Metropolis within Hastings. And I'll show you an example of what this actually can be quite, like, be very, very useful. Uh, and GIP sampling looks like this. So here you see, like, you force one dimension and one component and then another component. And then you always accept in, in the case of GIP sampling. So this is, you end up this. and. Uh, we can speed it up and see how like see how it converges uh, relatively quickly. It was a fairly good job. Uh, and looking at more, uh, uh, the more like the donut shape is also just a really really good job. But again, this is generally not going to be applicable, particularly when you go to higher dimensions. But here you can see there's a much much better job than Metropolis Hastings does, right? But as I said, it's not really applicable in high dimensions and not applicable to general problems because we don't have access to this particular quantity that we really need. And so in those cases, we really need something like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So the idea, idea with Monte Carlo is, is kind of similar to like momentum and so on optimization, where we now make a proposal. We try to make a proposal, uh, the proposal distribution more efficient by giving like basically a kick in a certain direction of the gradient of the target distribution. Specifically, we construct like a Hamiltonian system that looks like this, where the, the U here is actually containing the, 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 the distribution that we're interested in. And this kinetic energy is related to this auxiliary variable, this momentum variable that was just sort of introduced that will sort of be the, the kick effectively. This is generally considered the sort of the goal center for most exponential problems. And there will be several variants of this. Um, so what we can do now, we can sample from target as, as follows. We sample this xi and vi, but this is the velocity, right, that we actually don't really care about, but this we do care about. From this sort of extended target, we've taken the exponential to the power of minus h. And the reason why we take the exponential is because then we have um, then we have this part, right? So this is taking the exponential here, it's additive, so we end up with an exponential of this thing times the exponential of this thing, exponential of minus log p is equal to um, sort of minus h, so this should be like exponential of log p, and then we end up with just p. And so we get back the original thing. And this here is just a Gaussian. So the point here is that when we discard these momentum variables, so also after we sample from this, we discard the momentum variables, and then we only return the position variables that we're actually interested in. Uh, yeah, here is the, and here we can sort of see why this actually works, is because when we integrate out this, these, these momentum variables, it should be a v here and a v here we get back the p of x that is the original one. The problem is still, how do we perform this step, right? We say now we sample from this distribution, but we basically like push this p that we're trying to sample from into this now seemingly more complex distribution that we're interested in. But we use Metropolis uh, Hastings again, and it will kind of work out. So the idea here is that now we use a proposal, which looks like this. So we sample this, uh, this velocity, um, from a normal distribution with some mass matrix, this should be mass matrix M inverse. Um, and then we simulate the Hamiltonian system for some time t using this, this should be uh, plus one, using this momentum. And then we get back x, uh, x tilde t uh, my, minus, well, this should be like this, and this should be fine. Um, then we get this x uh, i, uh, i plus 1 plus a v tilde i plus 1. And then, um, so basically here there is we sample this direction that we're going to kick it in, we simulate it, and then we get back the actual sample together with the velocity. And then we're going to drop this because we're not actually interested in it. We're only interested in this part. And then we reject, accept or reject uh, the transition using these sort of... Um, Using, using the acceptance probability as before in Metropolis system. As it turns out, this is like a very efficient proposal. Um, and there's many reasons for this that I'm not going to go too much into. But in practice, we also need a numerical scheme for integrating this part. And so you can generally use any subjective integration scheme. And in, for example, Turing, we can use virtually like any that is available in differential equations of JL if you want to. But typically, you use Sleepfrog or like the Sternwell uh, integrator with some given step size. As the, the reason why we do this is because it's relatively cheap to compute. And plus, the energy error is quadratic in, uh, in, um, in, in, uh, in the step size. But still, we had this sort of slight annoyance with agency, but this is kind of not avoidable, um, which is that we, we have to retrieve, compute gradients uh, of the potential. But assuming we can do this, we move on. <laughs> 
So here you can sort of see an example of how uh, HMC works. And as you can see, like the, the sort of proposals are generally quite a bit uh, more varied than the, the, the sort of Gaussian proposals that these, these, um, um, the metropolis stacing that we saw earlier, right? It integrates for quite a long time. And it basically, so here you see this thing, this arrow is like the momentum that we sample, and then we integrate along this direction. And then we pick, we accept or reject this endpoint. So you see green arrow, green arrow here. We can speed it up, right? And we can look at a scenario of this donut. And in donut, it becomes very obvious how um, HMC can be much, much more efficient than HMC, and uh, much more efficient than metropolis stacing. So like something like random walk metropolis stacing. I mean. And here you see it, when, the, when the momentum is sampled sort of in the direction that is parallel to the, um, like basically like parallel to this, uh, to the surface, you end up traveling quite a bit further. And so this will do a much, much better job than exploring this entire distribution, this entire sort of um, a set than metropolis testing would. And this is kind of like, here you see one, this is generally abuse. It will make much larger, larger steps. And also in general, like the nice thing about HMC is that you can even see, see this in the convergence bound. So if you look at sort of how it scales with dimensionality, the scaling is, is I think it is D to the four or three or something like that. It's, it's much better than, than metropolis testing, which is generally going to be, be uh, exponential, like quadratic. Um, so this is like in the sense of like how many number of samples you need to get uh, to get to the target. Is there any like any questions this far? No, okay, that's good. I'll assume it's all understandable. But of course, in HMC, you still can also choose. Um, um, it's never like you still have to choose this epsilon, for example, and by implication, this integration time. And if you choose a bad value, you can see here now it becomes. Quite, like it also degenerates quite a bit compared to metropolis hastings, right? Like in general, the yeah, here the integration error will be so large that we actually end up rejecting rejecting a lot of the points. And so this is the problem, right? We have to choose the step size. We also choose the mass matrix. And unfortunate choice can actually do very pathological behavior. Here is an example where you choose the step size and the integration time just right. It will basically end up at the point where it started every time. Um, which is yeah, this is this is gonna actually ruin everything. It's, it's, this does not converge to, to anything useful. Um, and so this can partially be solved by allowing to sample any trajectory along the points. Um, so this is metropolis hastings that we want to look at is only allows us to sample at the initial point or the endpoint, right? If we accept the endpoint, we go to the endpoint. If we reject the endpoint, we stay at the initial point. And the multinomial agency basically allows you to sample any point along the trajectory. And this avoids this sort of, um, as we see here, this avoids this this um, uh, this this sort of this pathological behavior that we saw before. Now you see the entire trajectory ends up where it started, but because we can sample any point along the trajectory, we end up actually still moving around. And there's still lots to be said. This requires creeping the entire trajectory memory. This parameter still needs to be chosen. And the and one important thing is that if the Hamiltonian energy actually the error actually goes to zero, so if the integrate the step size is sufficiently small then the integration time degrades compared to like the MH one. So this is when sort of no u time sampler enters. And this is kind of the gold standard for, for, um, for uh, MCMC today when you have access to the, the gradient of the target. And here, so you introduce this no u turn uh, criteria to avoid wasting computation. It's also much more memory efficient and has a good adaptation scheme for its parameters. Um, and you usually only need to specify the acceptance rate that you're interested in. would generally be something like 0 0.8 or something like that. So here you see it in action. And here you see it in, in uh, moving around in, in this, uh, this, uh, this donor shape again. And it's sort of quickly, um, yeah, so this is, this is just, which is, this is kind of like the way you want to go, basically. There's other notable mentions. I'm not going to have time to go into all of these things, uh, but it's ensemble samples. These are quite like very popular in astrophysics. Uh, and adjusted Langevin uh, is basically like, or adjusted Langevin is, um, is basically like um, metropolis tastings. If then in the adjusted case with the gradient, we're using the gradient for like one step. We have slice sampling, elliptical slice sampling, which I'll mention, I'll show in a bit. Then also for other families of method, right? We have variation inference and we have sequential Monte Carlo samplers different approaches. Um, one thing that I want to mention is that sequential Monte Carlo uh, is not equal to central, sequential Monte Carlo samplers. <laughs> these are like both construct like sequences distributions, but these are different approximations. And one is sort of the SMC it constructs distribution so that it basically in the case, for example, where um, 
where this this is like a time series of something, the SMC construct uh, construct a sequence of distributions PK such that um, it acts so that it estimates the, the sort of posterior of the XK at the given Y. While in SMCs generally constructed so that you estimate, for example, like all the XKs uh, given the Ys, right? So this is kind of like um, smoothing basically for, or this is more like filtering. And it's also the same as like this comma filtering is similar to this in the world does. There's a great result on the topic, I like here. And to confuse it further, SMC methods can be used as components in MCMC methods, for example, particle groups. So that's not too important. So we once so now we'll actually go to how to use this in, in Turing. So we consider like a simple state-based model of the form where we have some parameter theta, we have like some 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 uh, trajectory of like some these hidden states, and then we have some observations, some light years. So if the more interested is in filtering, then basically just one of these XTs, and filtering is the way to go. If the main interest is kind of in in so this this base parameters, these theta here, or like um, all the theta and these sort of hidden states, then you might want to consider MCMC. It doesn't mean that you can't do MCMC on state models. So for example, here's a quick example of um, estimating the position and velocity of something like a satellite or something, whatever you want it to be. So you consider this simple model of particle moving in one dimension. You sort of here, you start out with some, some x at some time size zero. This is a one dimensional problem. And then you sample it by you know, taking some delta t and moving the, the position by the velocity vt. And then you have some noise to the measurement. And then you also have some noise to the measurement delta vt. We only observe the position. This finally gets us to Turing. So here we just have a quick way of generating data. As I said, we, we sort of add this velocity times dt, and then we sample the velocity and make it, some, make it a bit noisy, and then we do the same thing here. We generate some data. This is kind of how it looks, uh, how this xt looks. And then we get to Turing. So how is how you define a model in Turing. So in this case, we have like this, um, this noise level from, for that feeds into the this sort of sequential model. Uh, this was as we said and then here's the initial point we sample the initial states for the, the position and the velocity and then we iterate over them and we just write out the equations as we did in the in the sort of generated model here as you can see it's really like same very much the same like in turn you just define these tilde statements to sample to define like this is something to be sampled and here, when you have a data, the like data here is passed as an argument in this case, and so this will not be sampled. This will be considered sort of fixed as conditioned one, right? And so now we can actually just, now we can instantiate this model, giving it the actual data that we have and the time and the DT. And then we can run nuts. Here. And so if you run nuts, we get this. And so if you look at the last sort of the time step here, we see that it's like, um, this basically, this contains the actual true value the so back is like up here, right? So here you sort of have this region that looks a bit like centered around this actual value, but it also has um, uh, some uncertainty to it. <clears throat> one, but one thing that you might notice is like this model is actually very slow when using nuts, and this is I've done this intentionally, um, particularly when using like forward, forward diff mode and so on. And so this will like scale horribly as you go to higher, like more like higher dimensions, so, like num large number of states and these kind of things. But what you can do, is, so this is kind of a nice thing with Turing is that we have access to a lot of samples and it's very flexible in how you work with them. And so here I'll just redefine the model slightly bit, uh, slightly because as I'm going to use an elliptical slice sampler, which I said is a, like a, is a variant, there's an MCMC sampler that is restricted to Gaussian, uh, Gaussian priors. Um, but this is, which is kind of like unfortunate, but it is very fast. It can work well, very well in these scenarios. And so here we just instantiate the model. We sample using now. So now I'm fixing this sigma. I'm going to relax this a little bit, but I'm fixing it for now because this is not normally distributed. And I'm using this ESS sampler. And here you see the result. It looks basically the same as we had with NAS. But this is much faster, right? This is two seconds versus uh, two minutes, because this does not require gradient evaluations or anything. That just requires evaluation of the, uh, the target. So you have a lot of Gaussian variables. You're looking at ESS, maybe like the effective sample size, the effect of, sorry, the elliptical stress sample size is a good idea. But we also want to further the sigma squared. Uh, and so the idea here is to construct a GIP sample with the, uh, the elliptical size size sampler targeting the size, right? So I, as you see here, the size here are just the sort of reparameterization of this, these X's. 
Uh, and then we use Metropolis Hastings to target this one dimensional variable signal. And so when it's only one dimensional, like uh, Metropolis Hastings can actually work very well. And so what we're doing now is we're first sampling the size, and then based on the size that we sample, we sample sigma using Metropolis Hastings. Again, ends up being very fast, there's no gradient valuations involved. And we end up with something that also looks very, very good. And again, we get uncertainty estimates. We have, uh, and we get the actual, uh, we recover the true values. This is all good. It's a very simple example. But then, um, I'm given the interest, like in the interest of time, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. But uh, in um, Dante asked, like, when you, uh, he sort of mentioned that they were sort of trying some MCMC, and uh, in practice, you end up facing a lot of issues, and it's kind of unclear how to deal with everything. And that's very, very true. Um, one particular thing is initialization, like choosing a good initial point can be very important and what qualifies as good is also somewhat difficult to say. Like in an ideal world, the initial point should be sampled from the target, but if we knew this, then there wouldn't be any, like there wouldn't be any point in doing MCMC in the first place. So what people often sort of do is this, they do this kind of thing called burn-in, where they basically run the chain for some iterations called M, and then you only start the chain from this, this M, and so the, your actual chain is like M plus one, da -da -da, M plus M. This is probably the most common way to, to initialize, initialize the uh, chains, but there's many other ways of doing it. And one like particular co comment that's like from 2011 is that burn is only one method and not a particularly good method of finding good starting points, which is this true. And also, but burn-in is mostly harmless, which is perhaps why the practice persists today, which is also still the case. Like people generally use burn-in and this just means running it until you get to a point that is, you know, within uh, this typical set that I mentioned, like where it's kind of close to a reasonable point on the distribution that you're interested in. There's also this notion of like thin thinning, which people have been doing for quite a long time. The idea here is that now you basically only take every beat uh, uh, samples from the sequence, so you end up with like n over b in this case. The original motivation is to reduce the autocorrelation time, as I mentioned, like which I mentioned earlier. But today, because in the 90s we kind of realized how to realize how to compute this, like uh, we had realized basically um, how the CLT works when we have when we're working with uh, these autocorrelated samples. Um, you generally should just compute the the, the the sort of the effective sample size, which accounts for the autocorrelation time rather than actually thin. The only reason why you would thin today is just saving on storage or memory usage, or if you want to do some visualization, then it could be useful. But generally, thinning is not a good idea. Like, it's not something that should be done, really. Choosing prior is a big, big topic. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm not going to be able to go into this, um, but uh, there's like some resources there, and I had some, uh, I did another talk at, at Guy Low Winter School 2023, which is great. And then, um, with the school, not my talk necessarily. And I dug a bit more into this and had like sort of very like a workshop basically on how to do this. So if you're actually interested in this, I recommend looking at the slides. Then we're looking at like an SIR model, which is also a dynamic model. The most common practice, you look at the prior predictive. So you just consider like if I generate from samples like uh, realizations from my prior, and then I simulate data from the light fields. I simulate data from the from the model instead of actually fixing the data. You look at basically how the prior affects the general data. For example, if you're modeling an epidemic, it doesn't make sense for it doesn't make much sense for the epidemic to die out tomorrow if 10% of the population is affected today, right? And so you want to make sure that this prior kind of ideally it doesn't allow this to happen, right? It has zero probability that would you do this. And in more sort of principal ways, something called simulation-based calibration. I'm not going to go into it in the interval of time, but it basically corresponds to simulation from the prior, sample data sets, and then you run posterior inference on these, these sort of simulated data sets. And if you do this, you should actually recover the prior. So if you do this for large enough, like for a lot, uh, enough times, you should recover the prior. This is a very, very good check. And so here's like a very simple example. Um, where like I have a mixture of Gaussians, this is class of prior, and then I basically remove the fact that one of them is a negative component here and one is a positive. And then, uh, so in the end here, like the actual likelihood doesn't just completely drops this, the sign of the, the thing. And so if I run sampling here, uh, I, like it looks deceptively good, right? But if I keep running it, what I see is that half, basically like 44% of the time, HMC will say that the, the mode should be at minus 100 by 50, but like the other the rest of the time, it should be at plus 100, while under the actual prior, it should be only 25% of the time negative and 75% uh, positive. And so here you can see that this actually like, doesn't recover the, the prior when we keep running this process of like sampling from it and generating the sampling data, sampling from the generated data. So. Um, 
usually in practice, often two exp uh, computational expansions, you do like a couple of times to get, get a few of you. And then when things go wrong, it can be quite difficult to like figure out actually what went wrong. Uh, there's a very good resource on the topic. I'm linking to that. Um, and in interest of time, I'm also not going to go through this too much. Um, but it has like a general kind of approach of how you journey, uh, how you go through these things. And there's also one thing that's quite interesting for these kind of uh, very ill-conditioned and um, inverse problems is this notion of tempering. So usually, in interest of time, I I can't go through it too much. But um, this is also related to kind of how some people I've, I've heard people mentioning that they have to sort of basically like um, disseminate the data to get um, CBC to do something useful. And this um, basically is a form of tempering. Um, and the one on one, so it's basically here where you just uh, subsample the data basically effectively. Um, here's an example of tempering where you affect, you see all these like uh, green uh, distributions and slowly sort of, sort of going towards this blue one, which is the actual target. Um, uh, and the idea basically being that you 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 make you make a sequence of distributions that are easier and easier to sample from, and then you slowly move towards the actual target. So here you sort of see that we create positive probability mass between the most we can actually move between them when we do MCMC. And there are two factors, like many two factors of doing tempering in Julia. One is called pigeons, and one's called MCMC tempering. I recommend pigeons for now. Pigeons is, is a really good one. It's also implemented by some of the authors that have done some great work on on tempering uh, in the recent couple of years. And this actually works very well. Um, so highly recommend looking at that if you actually run into these kind of issues. Finally, I'll just very briefly go to sort of how the nice thing about you know Turing is that it's very general purpose. It uh, integrates well with sort of any Julia code you want to put in there. So there's no restrictions. The only restrictions that we have is when on the actual lines that has this tilde in it. And if it doesn't have a tilde, you can kind of do whatever you want. And so here's like an example where I, I use this to do inference of the heat equation. So in the heat equation, we have um, we have sort of the, the, the PDA that looks like this. I will just use this initial condition and the boundary conditions are so. And we want to in, do inference over this D, so we don't know this D. So I first generate some data. You see the true D here is 0 0.25. And then I use uh, just sort of use like a discretized PDA with finite different method. Um, and so this is here. And then I'm using um, differential equations to actually solve the problem. And so then I get the true solution, which is basically uh, yeah, you get the true solution, and then we're going to sort of add some noise to it, and this is what we end up with, right? So here's the on the x-axis we have the, uh, the positions, and then we have time is the different lines, basically. So then finally you run inference. So here is like a, a a Turing model. So here I have this prior on my this D uh, diffusion coefficient. I have the noise uh, prior on the likelihood noise, and I just pass in the problem. I remake the problem. I call a solve, and it just works. And I get back this. And here you see I get the correct, like very close to the correct mean, and get the correct um, the, the noise. Looking at the distribution, it looks fine. It looks like it's mixed very well. And here you have the posterior predictor. So if I'd like try to actually double predict and see how it looks, then you see this sort of these bars here represents the actual uh, the probability over the, the, the true underlying solution. And you see it, it does actually cover the true solution, which is great, this sort of red dotted line. And one you can also ask, what if we only observe the first time step? So here, what I do is I only refer, like I remove basically every uh, time step except the first one. And I still recover the data, but now it has higher uncertainty as you would expect. And so here you see this also very clearly in the actual posterior predictor. Um, I think that is that is me. Um, and so with relative use of dynamic simple systems, in short, I think um, it really depends on sort of uh, dimensionality of the problem. If you're mainly interested in these like hidden factors, but right, like these hidden variables, then it's a, it's a good way to go. Um, and um, I think also like tempering approaches is, is a particularly uh, interesting uh, uh, approach these days that could be quite, quite useful. So yeah, but I think that's, that's me out of time. So thank you very much. And here, here are the references. <laughs>